Uh, thank you for asking me to come and uh, speak here this morning. Uh, and I spoke at the Baldock uh, conference last autumn and also at the base AGM. So I know there's many of you here at, uh, uh, that were at the base AGM. And uh, that's who we are. Uh, we're a land family business based in Huntingdon and uh, in Oxfordshire. So we're, we were invited as a result of the talks that uh, I gave at the base and also Baldock to, uh, to pull together a few farmers in, uh, to do some benchmarking on no-till. We've been benchmarking in LFB, or I've personally been benchmarking since 1992, so a lot of data uh, so, uh, coming through. And um, so we were asked to benchmark around about a dozen farmers uh, who have been no-tilling for some time. And I'm going to present some of the results and comparing no-till to conventional farming. Okay, so what, one of the first things I want to do is to go back to the, and so this, there's no slide on this, back to the base talk, and you, you, you in, in, in base who were up there can remember this. So some of the key points of where are we now, I wanted to just to rehearse. Number one, we're on a treadmill of being locked into a system at the moment, and this is conventional farming, not, uh, not no-till. Number two, where labour and machinery must be kept working and every productive area cropped. Number three, yield is king, and that's where I've been doing, doing the last 20 odd years, as you, some of you heard me speak before. We've seen a dash for land grab, uh, with key money paid for extra land, FBT, contract farming, etc., uh, where we're spreading fixed costs, or not spreading fixed costs, depending, and all supported by EU payments. So that's where, that's where we've been, and that's where we've, we've come from, and that's where, that's, I think that's why we're all questioning that now, and that's why we're all here, I guess. So that was the background I wanted to go through in the base talk. So uh, going, moving on to the benchmarking itself, and I'm con controlling this. So, yeah. so that works quite well. So the background is we, we, look, we were going to look at the 2017 harvest, which we have done, based in East Anglia. So all of these are fairly local, and people who have been doing no-till for many years. Okay. So we, were, we thought we'd ask a few questions around about the, the uh, not just the financial, a bit of background. So you can see down the bottom here, um, the drills. Dr it's all, all about the drills, so no, nearly all about the drills. So John Deere, um, uh, 750, 66%. Now, one thing you'll see that not, those don't add up to 100%. So many, many of the people in the group had more than one drill. Okay, 66 16, 33, and 33 don't add up to 100. So those are the sort of drills that most people had. Okay, so that's some of the background we went in to see, to look at. What, one of the other things that I personally wanted to do as well was to look at this, we've, we've got this, um, this uh, correlation between soil and yield in no-till. So this, these are just the first indication. Um, oh, sorry, that was one before that. So the reasons, sorry. I pulled over two pages. Uh, the, the, re the reasons we wanted to uh, uh, look at as well. So financial reasons, 42%. Now, I would sort of question whether, whether the, the, they were quantified. 55% uh, environmental and 3%, I think it is, yeah, 3% um, other reasons. So um, those are the environmental reasons, 55, financial, 42 so what we wanted to do, or what I would like to do, is want to, to help to measure and quantify this leap of faith. Okay? So, and I would, and I would, I would sort of question the people who have already done this into this leap of faith without actually costing it out. Uh, so hopefully we can actually put some meat on the bones uh, of this. And they add up to 100. 42, 55, and 3 should add up to 100. So uh, next, soil types. These are the sort of soil types, groups of soil types we had. They're all based in East Anglia, uh, so they're roughly the same, but different, different mixes of soils uh, up there. And then we have the size of farms at the bottom, ranging from 300 to 400 acres up to over 2,000 acres. Now, just want to make sure to make a point here that these, all my figures are going to be in acres, um, not in hectares. So with Bre I thought with Brexit coming on, we wanted to be ahead of the game. And so, so <laughs> you would get back to acres. Uh, and, and also, they're about two and a half times more accurate, I think, uh, than, he than hectares. 
Okay, yeah, thank you. Um, right, okay, so based on that, let's go back to where we were going to on that wheel, uh, wheat yield. So we've had a quick stab at looking at wheat yield and soil. Okay, heavy on the left, you can see, and uh, light soil on the right. So you can see that, and that's the wheat yield correlation. They're dotted all over the place, okay, and there's a huge variation which you'll see later on. But there is a correlation. Now, this is something we, I hope to be working more on. And this is something that's often said. Uh, but we want to actually start to quantify, quantify this. OK, let's drill down more into um, not the finances yet, but look at some yields, etc., cetera, and, and then into, into gross margins. OK, now one of the key points is, um, is that wheat yield is down around, down around 20%. Okay, and that's the top line up there, 3.42 to 2.68. Now, I'm, I'm starting to do some of the headline figures here. Let's not get too worried about it, but wheat yields were down to, to around about 20% between average no-till, the average is the key point as well, versus the average LFB land family business survey. Thanks, Tom, for arriving on time. Um, so, wheat yield is down 20%. Uh, up there, and others as well down. But let's start looking at the bottom. So the output obviously is 293 on the left versus 418. This is all figures per acre, as I just mentioned. Variable cost per acre, 150 compared to 169. And then the gross margin, average 143 compared to 249. Okay? 143, and hopefully you can see at the back these low, low down figures here. There's a difference there of £100 an acre down. However, like, like in all the data that we've been doing since 1992, the key is in the variation. Okay? So that's just the first indicator, the, the snapshot of, 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 of what's happening in terms of gross margin. So in terms of variation, we go back and have a look at um, no-till and then the low and the high. So the variation in wheat yield, although the average was down, 1.63 is the lowest, 3.52 was the highest. Okay, 3.52. If we go back to the previous slide, top right, 3.52 is slightly higher than the average in 3.42. Okay, so there is a variation. Some people are managing wheat yields in no-till higher than um, higher than in conventional farming, if you want to call it conventional farming. Okay, so yields in tonnes per acre, variable cost down, um, down to the bottom. So we're looking at uh, the variations in no-till, low, left, high on the right. Wheat, 1.63, all seed rate, 0.39 to 1. Uh, barley, 1.26 to 3.29. Um, variable cost, 91 to 186. So you can see, and the, the, we've, see, we've seen these variations in, in the benchmarking we've been doing since 1992. There's exactly the same range of variations. Gross margin ranging down from 88 up to 241. Now 241 is in, 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 up in with the highest, uh, with, the, with the average in conventional farming. Okay, so, this, so we can see down on average, but huge variation is the conclusion at this, at this moment. Okay. So let's now look at some of the costs, and this may be uh, an interesting area. Labour and machinery costs. Costs are down 43% labour and machinery costs, where the no-till average is £120 per acre, and our uh, standard benchmarking is 213. Two, okay, so there's a huge drop in costs, and this is what you're, you're expecting. So what we've seen is drop on average in in yields, gross margin, and costs. Okay, so this now it's starting to get a bit interesting, I think. Um, so, and let's look at some of these costs in more detail now. <clears throat> so, one of the surprising things I found actually um, was, and we need to look at this in a bit more detail. Uh, what we've done, obviously, is just taken the, the 17 harvest of the group of farmers. We haven't even discussed it with them yet. They haven't even seen their figures yet. So there's some of them in the audience, well, a few of them in the audience here, perhaps most of them in the audience, I don't know, here um, uh, looking at their own figures. Uh, but they don't know which is which, okay? They don't know the higher or lower. We haven't, we haven't been back to them yet. 
Uh, we, we've been, they, they have been asking us, but we haven't given them the figures. Um, so what, one surprise I said is, um, because I think it's often said with no-till, you're saving time you know, you, and, you, and releasing time, but labour costs up there, we need, to, we need to look at that in a bit more detail on some of our, uh, some of our group. 38 and 26. The key point to here is because the key driver, as you know, I do a lot of talking, a lot of in, uh, looking at machinery costs. The key driver of machinery costs is the amount of kit you have. The amount of capital, pounds per hectare, pounds per acre you have. So depreciation, and we calculate the depreciation, so it's the same all the way through. It's not different types of depreciation. 38 compared to 63. This is a key driver, I think, because 38 equates to around about 211 pounds per acre of capital. Whereas 63, and I know this for a fact in our own survey, equates to around about 350 pounds per acre. The, the red marker doesn't work on this very well. 63 up there equates to 350 pounds of capital. And many farms have built up that because we've had huge inflation in machinery over the years, over the last, over the last few years. Repairs 19, as I said, the key, the key driver is the capital. If you haven't got the machines to repair, you don't have the repair costs. 19 compared to 25, uh, another key factor obviously is, is fuel, 13 compared to 21, other bits and pieces, 5 to 8. So that's where the 120 compared to the 213 is made up. Okay, so um, we're now going to start looking at the, at the profit, uh, the actual, we've got the, we've got the, the, the output, and we've, and we've dropped the costs. So uh, the next one is, okay, so the profit from arable. Um, and this, so what we're looking at here is, is in businesses, the business we looked at uh, in, in terms of our own, the, the no-till benchmarking is just down to the, uh, um, down to the, the gross margin labour and machinery level. We're not looking at other parts of the business. Many of you have rental income, all sorts of bits and pieces. We're just looking at profit from arable is what we're talking about, which is there. Okay, so the profit from arable is, um, so based on what I've just been through now, any, any of you any indication whether no-till has got a higher profit versus conventional? Which one do you think is the highest? Hands up for no-till, higher but margin. Hands up for conventional, higher. And then about 80% no-shows, okay. <laughs> Right, okay. So, um, yes, okay, so because I'm an accountant, I can juggle around with figures. Uh, so, the, the answer is no till 23, and the, uh, and the, uh, the average, these averages, remember, there's a huge variation, uh, the standard is 36. Okay, so at this stage, it is 23 versus 36. A couple of points I, I want to make at the bottom here. How are we doing for time? Let me see. Chair, oh, you're there. Oh, sorry, I hadn't seen you. We're okay, are we? Um, okay, you're going to give me a countdown, I think. Really. Yeah. So, um, where are we? So, 23, 36. Two points I want to make, and then I want to make a very, very third point. It's not on the slide. No account has been taken for the increase in soil health, so we haven't put a financial you know, positive to that. So, obviously, soil health has increased, and we haven't, if you put a, a financial part on that, you add it to the 23, of course. But 23 is pounds in your pocket to pay the Tesco bill at the end of the week. You know, so that, and that's the, that's the crux of farming, isn't it, these days? Um, until the IX payments come in, or the BPS payment comes in. So no account's been taken for the increase in soil health. And I think the, the other point is the no-till profit from our... That 23, okay, has a range, and I'll be talking about ranges all the way through, has a range of positive 118 down to minus, brackets means minus, Minus 34, and this is where, where the positive point comes in, and this is where we hope to be um, knowledge sharing and actually doing all that work. Okay, so 23 versus 36, but the range of the 23 is 118 versus 34. This is obviously a range in 36 as well, you know, around about £100 an acre range there as well. So, however, and I haven't got a slide on this, the ultimate test is cost of production per tonne. Okay, so the cost of production per tonne of wheat in terms of the figures we've got. So we've got 23 versus 36. Do you think the cost of production per tonne will follow that? Do you think the cost of production per tonne is higher in no-till? Hands up. Cost of production per tonne higher 
in no till or lower lower in no till yay <laughs> yeah well the cost of production for no till is 101 pounds a ton of wheat okay and the cost of production for I'm not run out of time am i the cost, the cost of production per ton for conventional is 111 okay and that's the ultimate test i think isn't it 111 versus 101 so a 10 pound a ton cheaper to grow no-till. After going through all those different figures and variables, etc., on average, it's £10 a tonne cheaper to grow no-till based on the group we've got, smallish group. We're going to drill down into more, more, more detail, actually. So that is really good news, and I'm really, really pleased that it's come stand in front of your audience to say it that way around, okay? Which is a good result. We'll have a cheer at the end. Uh, so, um, just to keep, I'm going to finish up key points and conclusions, is that okay? Yeah. So key points and, um, and conclusions from what we've done. So I think the key point, because of the range, what we want to do with a group that we're benchmarking is to knowledge share. So we're going to have meetings on the farm, maybe the first meeting. We might get an invite to come here for the first meeting, Mr. Chairman, possibly. Uh, for the group to, to, to come back here, analyse our figures in more detail, learn from each other, look at the range, and then and, and see if we can uh, up everything, and then we'll, in, that we'll increase that margin of £10 a tonne, hopefully even more. So, just to conclude, and, and I don't know how many of you, have you many of you have, have heard me talk in, recently in the base talk and that sort of thing, but obviously before that, my, my yield is king talks were... <laughs> will yield this king, unfortunately. So, um, so I, I have been, you know, I've been enlightened, I guess, by, by carry, asking to carry out this benchmark and, and being involved with base, etc. over the last 12 months or so, or so. It's really opened my eyes, I must admit. So yield is king. We need a different approach uh, and way of thinking to yield is king, um, which is why you're all here. So, and I think the other thing I've learned as well, we need, we need individuals who question convention, uh, take risks, uh, which, which, is, which is part of what I've just learnt uh, as well over the last 12 months. Innovative, um, but what, you know, where are these people? And I would say these people are at Groundswell and you're in this room. Uh, so I, you know, I, I really want to end up by applauding you for what you're doing for British arable farming, actually, which is uh, really good. And, 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 the, and the figures actually show it does work. Um, the details of our figures, uh, are, we have a table just outside on the right as you walk out. Uh, we haven't, haven't given any of these details out so far, but the details of, of all these figures uh, on a handout outside on the way out. I'm not sure where I am on time, but I've finished. Thank you very much. So I think I have. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Thank, Thank you very, very much. much, Gary. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I imagine there'll be some questions. Any questions? Oh, there's one. Just wait for the mic, please, and um, say who you are. Don't be shy. Cheers. Hi there. Uh, Ryan Hudson, agronomist. Um, I was just wondering, Gary, what the sample area, if you've got it for the no-till against the, the sort of conventional system, what, I can't remember you said what the area was on the sample for the... No-till. Sorry, I can't see where you are, sorry. Oh, there. there. No, sorry, I've yeah. got you. Yeah. Just what the yeah. sample area was under no-till compared to the LFB averages? Oh, right, yes. LFB averages are, uh, well, they start quite small for 17 harvest and they build up to about 100,000 acres, you know, because that is the, our big data that we do. Um, the, the, uh, the, the total for the no-till is a small group, obviously, compared to that, will be... Uh, I haven't got the total with me, it's several thousand acres, uh, and it's up to a dozen farmers. Okay, um, okay. I don't, yeah, and uh, another point really, from what Clive and Jake were saying, obviously there's a transition from yeah. profitability from year one, two, perhaps, compared to four and five. Are you able to sort of tease out how long those guys have been in no-till and the, and the change in terms of year one and two against Absolutely. five and six, yeah, perhaps? Yeah, sure. And that's some work I've done in the past. Very interesting question that, because I have concluded in the past that, uh, and work I did many years ago for articles in Farmers Weekly, I believe, 
is, is uh, uh, where you have to reinvest and re, re sort out your kit, etc. And, um, and the drop in yield that you have initially in those first two or three years, it's, it's a big leap of faith and it's a big hit to the bottom line. And I, in the past, I have concluded that many farms couldn't afford to do it. Okay? And, it's, and so it's a very good question. Um, the the no-tillers that we were asked to look at have been doing it for some time. As a very, in in the, one of the very early slides, actually said, been no-tilling for six or seven years. Okay. So, and I think it's one of the things that uh, now we've done this and we're going to look in more detail uh, and our plan is to extend, to extend this group and have more groups and we're talking to base about the potential of benchmarking as well. Uh, and so one of the things I would like to do is to start to revisit, uh, I did find it actually, it was it's about 10 years ago I looked at this, and, and revisit that to see how we can actually move from a conventional system caught, you know, caught, caught on a, in a, um, what did I call it, treadmill. We're, we're, all, we're stuck in this treadmill. How do you get out of the treadmill into this system, I think is the, is the thing you're asking. There are, tax, there are tax problems with that as well, because you're, sell, you're selling, when you downscale kits, you get balancing charges, etc. So it's quite a complex thing to do. But we didn't look at it in, in, in now, but I'm really, really keen to look to see if we can actually get some sort of blueprint or something like that to actually help people transition from the treadmill into a no-till system. Is that, does that answer your...? Yeah, OK, thanks. Uh, hello, Mark Dews. Um, it was interesting to see the difference in uh, financial performance measured as either uh, cost per tonne or profit per acre with most farms being limited by the number of acres they have rather than the number of tonnes that they produce, which do you think is the most important metric? Ton, tonnes, obviously. Tonnes. And, and, and actually, and, uh, tonnes and obviously cost per tonne, or margin per tonne. Um, it's very interesting that I have... We, we have clients, all sorts of clients, and we have clients that have built up empires over the years, and over the last two years, I have had clients have downscaled dramatically. Uh, one client downscaled by a thousand acres and gave up a thousand acres because he was just chasing his tail on a contract farming agreement. You know, if you, in, and I could talk about contract farming agreements quite a long time. And just a, just a very interesting point in terms of the LFB data we have it is that um, the, the contract farming income, and I have it here actually, the contract farming income from uh, in on average um, contract farming income 157 pounds per acre. Okay, contract farming income. This is the average on this is the average on 16 harvests. So it's quite a large group. Is 157 pounds an acre, and the total labour and machinery costs are 210. So you can see there's a bracket around that difference. So on average, people are losing money out of contract farming. So, so therefore, I think the point is we shouldn't be chasing acres. We should be looking at cost of production per tonne. Does that answer that? Not quite, no. Oh, um, <laughs> I, I may misunderstand, but, but if your limiting factor is uh, the number of acres that you can farm, okay, sorry, sorry. and you are making less per acre through a no-till system, even if your cost per tonne is reduced, yeah, then sure. it seems to me to be more profitable in the shorter term to uh, maximise your profit per acre, uh, given that that's your limiting factor. Yeah, OK. So I absolutely understand that point. I think you need a combination of both. Um, so we have many clients who have large acreages, and the more acres you have, the more money you lose. OK, so if you... <laughs> I agree if you're, if you're in a position where you're losing money per yeah, acre exactly. yeah, uh, sure. in, yeah. in your current system. But, uh, uh, but if you're not, then, then that, that metric doesn't work quite exactly. so Exactly. It's, it's a complex yeah. metric, and, and I have actually, and I've, I've got some papers with the outside where I have uh, done a lot of work on managing negative margins. The, the point being is that the, the way I'm answering you is that if that additional acreage is contract farming, which it normally is, and you're losing money on it, you'd better be not, not to be contract farming and then focusing on cost per tonne. So, so it's, a bit, it's a combination of both. But adding acres at a negative margin doesn't work, and, and many of us have been doing that. We, we certainly agree on that point. 
Sorry? We certainly agree on that point. <laughs> Good, OK. Yeah. And we can have a discussion afterwards as well, if you like. Uh, come on, there's one down here. <laughs> Where are we? The crutches the front. <clears throat> Thank you very much. A cool, uh, uh, tip for it would be very interesting to you. You showed a big variation in the yield from light to heavy land. It would be interesting to have some statistics. I don't know how many farmers you no till farmers you 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 analysed, but it would be interesting to have some statistics on uh, how how many of those farmers were heavy land and how many would like, because there's such a huge variation in wheat yield. Yeah, and if, absolutely. And if, if, if most yeah. of the farmers that you looked at were heavy farmers, then that, that is going to, statistically, go to uh, bias the... Completely the, distort it. Absolutely, yes. I yeah. agree. So, uh, so ba based on, yeah, ba based there, if, the, yeah, if these, these are very good farmers on poor, in that, you've got a combination of soil types and you've got a combination of the var variance in the numbers. It seems Absolutely. It's very early days, as yeah. I said. So, you know, th th that's just the first thing. You know, it's such a huge difference. Yeah. And, and sure. uh, the, the, the statistical yeah. analysis of, of your farms and the soil types would seem to uh, be incredibly important yeah. because yeah. it could shift. Absolutely could. And so I did say that's a first indication based on face, yeah. value, face value alone. And that's something that we want to look at. And this is why this is all we've done is taken that we've been to every farm, you know, to make sure we have consistent data. Uh, so the, the data consistent. Uh, and now we want to have the groups. So we've only just started on the project. No, basically. no, no, no. no. I, and, I and so that. absolutely take your points. And yeah, th there's huge variations in, and there, there are two or three variables working together. But really, you yeah. know, it could shift it. Absolutely, could. Yeah, yeah. Thank so you. that's why I'm really excited because, I, you know, it's the, the work's yet to be done. So perhaps if you invite me back in 12 months' time, I might have that answer. Thank you very much. Absolutely. <laughs>